Hi everyone, in today's video I want to show you how I made this shoe storage unit for the entrance of a house. Um, it is basically made from bits of material that was kicking around the workshop that I had. So for example, this double thickness birch fly was from a DJ booth that I made for a client about a year ago. Uh, the linoleum was from a sideboard restoration that I've done a while ago. And really the only material that I bought new was the plywood for for these sliding doors. Now, originally I was going to use like these reclaimed bit of plywood with the uh, uh, printing on that came from old discarded art crates. But as you, I'm not sure if you can see on the video, but it's quite warped, so it caught um, inside slides. So it didn't really work, so I decided not to bother trying to straighten them up, and I just made new ones. So on the inside, if you look here. It's a relatively straightforward construction, just a rectangular box really, but on the inside I've used a metal mesh and that is to allow airflow to go through the unit. Just because I don't like it when you put shoes that is wet, either from outside or from sweat, into a completely closed box, um, it, just, it just feels a bit musty. So this one I've designed also because I had mesh to let air flow through and then it can also come through these holes at the top. Another function for these holes is because there are plug sockets behind this unit is that you can drop a cable in there and then charge phones or uh, headphones or something like that and it just keeps everything tidy. Anyway, let's go and have a look and I'll show you how I've done that. For this unit I decided to use leftover materials that I had laying around the workshop. This large piece here, which will become the top of the unit, was originally intended for a much larger DJ mixing desk that I made, but it was damaged during the CNC cutting. This is also why you'll notice all these extra grooves in it, since this is a unit for my own house rather than for a client's, and since these are on the inside of the unit and I wouldn't see it, I felt happy to use it rather than to let it go to waste. The repair of this breakout, which I show you later in the video, came out very well. So I'm glad I didn't end up throwing such a large piece of good material in the skip. The original piece had these pull shaped cutouts to pass wires through its top. I decided to repeat these on this unit. So here I'm just using an off cut piece to mark them out where I want them, one in each corner. I then used a spade drill and a jigsaw to cut the bulk of the material out, making sure to stay a few millimeters inside of the line. Once done, I clamped the original piece I used as a template onto the top and used a router to cut it to its final dimension. As you can see here, the top already has two grooves cut in the edge since the original piece it was intended for also had similar sliding doors. To duplicate these grooves to the piece of wood that would become the base of the unit, I carefully transferred the measurements across and then used this plunge saw mounted on a guide rail. This is the first time I properly used one of these and I can honestly say I doubt I'll be without one in the future. They are very accurate and once you do get used to them, very fast to use. For a stable base, I use a off-cut piece of polystyrene foam as a spoil board. The foam is lightweight, which makes it easy to maneuver and just carry around and you can cut into it without the added resistance you would get from a piece of timber if you use that as a spoil board. I then quickly use a router to cut grooves where the perforated metal shells would eventually rest in. One of the few drawbacks of plywood is that it is easy to sand through the top layer of ply and then you spoil the whole surface of the material. To prevent this, I don't use multiple grits of sanding paper on the face of the plywood. I simply start and finish with a 240 grit. You might sand a little bit longer, but you do remove considerably less material, which means there is less of a risk of sanding through. The inside shelves can be set at different heights using standard shelf support pins, the type of pins that you see in kitchen cabinets. Here I'm using a simple drilling template just to make sure that the holes are exactly the same distance apart. This is important as it ensures that the shelves will sit level when they are fitted. With the main pieces all cut and prepared, it was time for the dry fit. It is always worth taking one's time to do this and thinking through your glue up and what order you want to clamp it in um, and where you want to use screws that are out of sight. For example, here I realized that because the clamps I was using were new, they still had their factory end stops welded in. 
in order for me to attach two clamps together to get to the length I needed to clamp across the whole piece, I first had to sand these factory end stops off so I could remove the jaws of the clamps. Now it seems like a very obvious thing, but having to sort it out after you apply the glue could cause a load of extra work or even spoil your whole piece. All of which is very easily avoidable by simply just taking your time, prepping properly for the glue up and doing a dry fit to check what steps come next. Here, with the clamps all preset to the required widths, I can take my time to make sure everything is square and lined up <coughs> before tightening it all up. The screws I'm adding here are to the bottom of the piece and will be removed later to leave only small holes, which I can live with since I will very rarely stick my head under this unit. After letting the glue dry overnight, I was back in the workshop and started working on cutting the French cleat. Again, the plunge saw set to 45 degree angle mounted to a rail did a sterling job of cutting through the 36 mm plywood. If only my manual focusing skills on my camera were as crisp as this. A quick sanding to take the edges off and these were ready to be glued in. As with the top, you'll notice grooves across this piece of timber. These have no function for the purposes of this job, but I didn't want to throw it away and as I'm not going to see it, it didn't bother me since it's inside the cabinet. To glue the top cleat into its place, I used clamps and then added a couple of screws from the top just to keep it secure in position until it dried. I intentionally left the vertical sides slightly proud. Now that the unit was glued up, I used a router to cut it flush to the top and then gave the completed unit a good sanding to 240 grit. The next step was to fix the breakout that ruined the top in the first place. The first step was to get the break to a square hole of a consistent depth. For this I used a router and a chisel to cut out the material slightly larger than the damaged area. Once I was happy with this being deep enough and square, I could then mark and cut the other side of the puzzle. I used an off cut piece of ply, transferred the length directly from the hole and cut it to a bit thicker than the required thickness on the scroll saw. To cut it down to its final dimension I used a hand plane making sure to check carefully and often until I was happy with the fit. I then glued the piece into position, leaving it a little bit proud to the front for sanding down later after it dried. Whilst I waited for the repair to dry, I made work of cutting the sliding doors out of this discarded art crate. I first used a jigsaw just to do the rough cutting and then I switched to the plunge saw and a rail to cut it to its final dimensions. And again, I can see why people are raving about this tool since it gave me a very accurate and very clean cut and it was quick to do. A quick spin on the pillar drill gave me the appropriately sized finger pulls and using the parallel side fence on the router made cutting the edges to fit into the sliding grooves quick and easy. And since the router was now set up to cut into edges anyway, I quickly cut all the grooves for the shelves where the perforated metal would go. With the repair completely dry, I was keen to see how it looked after being sanded back and blended into the surrounding timber. And as you can see here, it is almost completely invisible and on the finished piece you actually have to look to find it. With woodwork, it's weird. It is often these small little fixes that are disproportionately satisfying. It took me a while to decide what I wanted for the top of the unit. I have worked with a couple of interesting materials over the last few years and any of them would have been appropriate. I thought about using a cork that I could stain black or a more traditional walnut veneer but in the end I settled for this aqua colored linoleum that I had left from a sideboard restoration I did a few years ago. I like working with it, it cuts easily and it is very nice to touch since it is a natural material made from linseed oil and waste materials from the forestry industry. To apply the lino, I prefer to use contact adhesive as I did in the restoration video. But since I only had normal PVA wood glue, I had to make do and use that. The benefit of PVA is that you can move the lino around after applying it, at least for a few minutes. The drawback though is that it requires consistent clamping pressure across the whole surface. It's not the biggest problem, but it's worth being aware of when you choose which glue to use. And especially when it's a bigger piece, getting consistent pressure across such a large surface is not always simple. One bit of this build that did take me longer than a typical sideboard of this size normally would was the shelves. Rather than making them from a solid piece of board cut to the correct dimensions, each shelf was basically a frame made from four individual pieces of timber that were sized to hold a small section of perforated metal in the middle. 
To help align the glue, I used a biscuit cutter to cut into each of the pieces before gluing and clamping each shelf individually. To make the cutting of the perforated metal a little bit faster, I first drew the exact sizes on a discarded cardboard box. I then used these dimensions to cut the first of each size and then used the cut pieces to copy the exact same size pieces that I needed. Once cut, I cleaned the residual oil of the metal with white spirits, I let it dry and then I sprayed it with a matte black paint in a rattle can from a company called Hammerite. I like using Hammerite just because it doesn't require a primer and you can build up the layers until you're happy with the finish. By this time the glue on the shelves have dried and I could give them a quick sand. Also since the router bit is round it cannot cut perfect 90 degree corners and here I'm just using a chisel to quickly clean up the corners so that the perforated metal can fit properly into their slots. The glue on the top has also since dried, which meant I could trim the edges of the linoleum flush and give it a quick sand. The last task construction-wise left to do was to transfer the holes in the plywood into the linoleum on the top. For this I used a router bit with a bottom bearing, taking care to start in the middle of the hole as not to damage the edges of the linoleum. With the cabinet now completed, all that was left to do was to hang it. I cannot remember the last time I used anything else but a French cleat to fit a cabinet to a wall. Besides the fact that they are very secure and easy to get level, they are also very easy to use when working by yourself, even with much heavier units. Here I am fixing the bottom cleat to the wall using a bubble level app on my phone. This is not as accurate as if I have used a long spirit level, but since I didn't have one with me on the day, the phone app had to do and it worked surprisingly well. A final vacuum to get rid of the drilling dust and the cabinet could be hung. As I mentioned, since a French cleat has such a relatively large interface to the cabinet, you can maneuver quite a heavy awkward piece on your own. Once the unit was hung, I fitted the original doors that I planned to use and in a way I'm disappointed that these were too warped to use in the final product since I really liked the vintage look that the stenciled icons gave it. I did do some research into ways of straightening warped plywood with water and moisture and weights and things but I wasn't so wedded to the look that I absolutely had to have it. There is also a point in every project where you just want to get it completed rather than faff about with misbehaving doors. So these got scrapped and I made new ones. At this point I was very happy with the cabinet's design and proportions within the actual space but it did feel a little bit squashed into that corner which would become more noticeable once I hung the mirror back in its place right above it. It also felt a little high relative to the edge of the window pane. So to set this right I moved the bottom cleat to the left a little and down by a fraction and rehung the cabinet in its final position which looked much better. For the finishing I use Osmo oil as I do for most of my projects. It is easy to apply and unlike a polyurethane finish can be applied to nicks and scuffs without having to retreat the whole cabinet which was a key consideration given that this unit is mounted in the highest traffic area of the house and undoubtedly will get scuffed and nicked um, over the course of time. Here I'm fitting the shelving pins in the holes which can obviously be set at different heights. And even though this cabinet is designed to hold shoes, adding just that little bit of variability where the shelves can change height, it means that this can in future easily fulfill another function. So for example, I can use it as a sideboard for crockery, I can use it as a console to mount a television on, or as a drinks cabinet. The basic construction remains the same. But for now, it is a shoe rack and for this the perforated metal shelves is exactly what I wanted. Lastly, I fitted the newly made sliding doors. I find that simply laying a polished length of round steel bar in the bottom groove makes the door slide super easy since the friction is now between wood and metal rather than wood and wood. And with that, the unit was done. Well, there you go, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Please do remember to subscribe and send it around to any of your friends that uh, might enjoy the video. Until next time, goodbye.